today I, I want to talk about um, one of the more difficult things for a community to deal with, one of the more difficult things for us to, to cope with, to navigate when we're uh, <coughs> traversing life as a group. And uh, I'm going I'm to call it so the societal pressure to change. Society is kind of a um, hand that comes alongside it and wants us to be a certain way. This can bring us a lot of anxiety. Um, I think one of the times when we see this um, is when we uh, look at things like a recent research poll, uh, which tells us kind of something that we already kind of know about ourselves. Uh, we already kind of know that's going on. Um, a lot of young people are not going to church. Or we hear things like, you know, a local, two local churches are, are, are closing. Well, when we hear these things, this stresses us out. When we hear it, um, we almost, some of us feel uh, fear and anxiety. Some of us feel uh, the pressure, uh, almost seduced by it. We feel like, uh, if everyone else is doing it, maybe, maybe I should too. But what can happen then is that this anxiety uh, finds its way into our communities. We become communities of anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. You see, as, as this pressure from society to change, uh, it just kind of comes down on us, uh, we respond with fear and anxiety often. Now, uh, I, I don't think that's the right way to respond. I think that God is calling us to respond as a community. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, you often hear people say uh, society is... Uh, it, it's getting worse and worse. Society is it's really coming after us. But, I mean, if we look at the first Christians uh, in, in the early church, um, the pressure that they faced uh, was far greater. The, the pressure to conform uh, was far greater. And so I think uh, that the problem lies in how we choose as a community to respond. And I, I guess the question, the overall question that we're going to look at today is, how do we as a, a community... Remain a vibrant, life-giving community when we're facing this uh, pressure to change, or this pressure to be conformed to the pattern of the world. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're going to talk about. Um, but before we do, before we can get into the passage, I, I want to just give you a brief a refresher, um, because it's connected uh, very tightly to what we're going to talk about. Um, Paul has just got done telling the Philippians, the Philippian church, um, that they are part of a heavenly colony. And that as a part of that heavenly colony, one of the things that uh, uh, defines them is that they're anticipating the return of Jesus. They're continually hoping for and anticipating the return of Jesus. They're, they're, they're um, waiting for him to return and to restore their bodies, to uh, make them new, to bring about the new creation. Now, Paul's going to continue to build on this thought. Um, he's going to say in this first verse, he says in verse uh, 4, 1, Well then, my Christian friends, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, this, is, this, this, my Christian friends, is how you must stand firm in the Lord. Now what you'll notice, um, as I said, that this is connected um, to what he said uh, last week about them being a part of a heavenly colony. He's saying, well then, on account of this, on, because you are a part of this heavenly colony, uh, you should stand firm. Now, this word stand firm, um, it's a word that's used uh, elsewhere in Greek literature to talk about uh, a, a battalion of soldiers uh, standing firm. So it, when things are looking rough, when things are looking bad, uh, these are the kind of guys that would hang around, that would stay, they would, they would resolutely stand firm against the enemy. <clears throat> now, if we think about the Philippians, uh, when Paul is saying this to them, when we think about standing firm, we think about, you know, uh, the, we fear, you know, uh, maybe persecution from our aunt at Thanksgiving. <laughs> but when we, when we look at the Philippians, I mean, they were facing all kinds of pressure to change. Uh, verbal pressure, economic pressure, all kinds. Uh, for example, um, last week in Sunday school, we learned that um, one of the things that was believed about the early Christians by the, the general pagan populace was that they were cannibals. They, they believed that, that they would actually eat babies. They would uh, cut them up and eat them. 
Yeah, so, this, so imagine going to the grocery store and this is what people think about you. This is the rumors that are being spread about you. So they were under a lot of pressure. Uh, they didn't, it probably wasn't real popular to be identified as a Christian. <clears throat> now, when Paul calls them to, to stand firm, uh, that, that's what he's going to talk about of the rest of this message. How it is they can stand firm under this societal pressure to change, this societal pressure to conform. And so the, the first thing that he says, the first way that they can hold fast under this tremendous pressure, is he says in verse 2, and it, we're going to see this in verse 2 and 3. He says first in verse 2, uh, First, I beg Euodia, I beg Synecdoche, to agree with each other in the Lord. You see, Paul begs these two women. He urges them with some level of desperation. And what he wants them to do is agree with each other in the Lord. Now, Paul has actually used this language, this idea of agreeing with each other in the Lord, uh, earlier in Philippians. You might remember where we talked about humility. It's this idea of, of they're, able to, they're able to come together in one mind because they share this one Savior. They're able to practice the humility of Christ and lay aside their rights and opinions and accept one another and come to uh, a place of peace and agreement. Now, so, so we have the, this, this first part of this, the, He's, Paul is begging them. He is urging them, uh, uh, be of one mind. Uh, come together with the humility of Christ. Uh, love one another, care for one another, uh, exalt their needs over yours. But he doesn't just leave it, this, this issue of unity that he's striving for, this issue that he, he really desires. He doesn't just leave it to Euodia and Synecdoche. He uses this weird word here, uh, loyal yoke fellows. Mm-hmm. Probably won't ever hear that again. <laughs> Now, what does this mean? Uh, a yoke, um, it's actually a really interesting thing. A, a yoke is something that would be uh, put over the neck of an oxen. Um, and basically, they, they would, this would help them pull the till uh, as they were tilling fields and as they were doing other things. And so what Paul is saying here, and who I think he's talking about, is actually the entire church of Philippi. He's reaching out to them as a community. And what he wants them to do is he wants them to help Euodia and Synecdoche. You see, he sees himself as yoked to the church. He sees himself as a, a, a partner in accomplishing the gospel with these people. Mm-hmm. And so when he asks them to help them, he's not, he's not saying, uh, go out and suppress them. Go out and destroy them so that we can get rid of this insurrection. No, he says, help them. Come alongside them. So the image that we have here is one of reconciliation. Help them do the hard work of reconciliation. And why? Paul says, because they are women who fought at my side in the spread of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. Mm -hmm. And secondly, he says, because all their names are written in the book of life. Now, what Paul is talking about here is he's saying, hey, these people, they've partnered with me in the gospel. They've fought alongside me uh, for the spread of the gospel. But he also says that their names uh, are written in the book of life. Now, this word is a word that's used in Exodus. And it's just talking about the covenant people. Those who are written in the book of life are the people of God. And so what, what Paul is saying is, uh, help these people. They are part of your community. Uh, help them reconcile with one another. Come alongside them. Uh, their names are written in the book of life. So here in verse 2 and 3, we see that um, we stand firm by working together for the unity of the local church. And we accomplish this unity by practicing the humility of Christ. But this unity also requires us not to act just as individuals, but as a group. It requires us to come alongside each other, to be attentive to our community, to be aware of when things are breaking down, to not ignore when relationships are deteriorating. It requires a intentionality in our relationships. Now, again, I want to stress, this is not to oppressively force one another to conform. This is not to force, to coerce one another, but to come alongside and to partner with each other for unity. So what this tells us is that uh, we can stand firm under tremendous societal pressure as a community by coming together. Uh, both as individuals and as a group, 
and working for the unity of our local church. Now, this, the second thing. Paul moves on to a second thing in verse 4, and he tells them a, a second thing they must do in order to stand firm underneath this pressure. He says, second, rejoice at all times. Once again, I say it, rejoice. Mm-hmm. But Paul calls them twice here to this action of rejoicing. Yes, amen. This is, he wants them to take uh, an active role in taking joy in and celebrating. And, and what they're supposed to take joy in, what they're supposed to be celebrating, and, and I want you to, to think about this in the context of community. He's calling them as a community here. This is all, in the thir- in the, um, this is all speaking in group language. And he says, they must take joy in the Lord. They must look to the Lord. They must uh, uh, look to the Lord and celebrate the fact, take joy in the fact over and over again, rejoicing over and over again in the fact that Jesus died for them, that they belong to Jesus. And what this tells us is that we can stand firm underneath a tremendous societal pressure when we are a community who gathers and intentionally rejoices in Jesus. When we continually come back to the, to the altar saying, uh, Jesus, uh, we celebrate you. We celebrate your death. We take joy in your uh, life. Now, <clears throat> Paul moves in verse 5, uh, and he's going to offer us a, a third thing that we must do if we want to stand firm. He says in verse 5, Next, let your magnanimity be known to everybody. The Lord is near. Now, magnanimity. What does Paul mean by this? What is Paul demanding when he says, uh, have magnanimity? Let it be known to everyone. What he's talking about, he's, he's talking about uh, this certain uh, behavior, and it's, it's a certain virtue that's really hard to kind of understand in English. But uh, I think the best way, as I was reading, to understand it is to think about Jesus when he's on trial. He is above the pettiness. He is above uh, being sucked into the conflict, into the lies. He, he puts the rights of others above himself. He takes on this, this air of humility. And so that's what um, he's calling them to do, is to take on this attitude of coming alongside others. And, and, and another aspect of this, and again, this is a hard word to work out in the English, uh, but another way to understand it is somebody that, somebody that is not uh, uh, magnanimous when they are extreme rule followers, when they're extremely legalistic. And so what Paul is saying here um, is that if they want to stand firm under societal pressure to change, they must adopt this attitude of magnanimity. And they must approach everybody with it. Not just their family, not just their church, or their friends, but everyone. Mm -hmm. Even those who are hostile towards them. Even those who are violently opposing them. Paul then exclaims, the Lord is near. So he goes from saying, hey, be magnanimous to, to everyone. Everybody that you approach, take on this, this air where you're above retaliation, where you're above the pettiness of fights. We are not obsessed about the rules. And then he says, the Lord is near. See, I think what Paul is doing here is he is intimately aware that what he is saying for them to do is not easy. He is fully aware of the tremendous pressure that they face in their society. You see, in this, exclama- in this exclamation that he's making, Paul's reminding them that all the pressure, all the violence, all the hatred that they receive mm-hmm. will soon pass away. Amen. And they will share in the victory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Saying, the Lord is near. Take heart. The, the, the bruises that you face, the bloodying that you face, uh, the Lord is near. You will share in his victory. Amen. Now, as we try to apply this one, um, I think there's a really 
uh, something that really helps us understand uh, what this looks like when a church is, has begun to uh, lose its magnanimity. You may have been to a church like this. Um, you, you go in, and you're new to the church, and as you're walking in, this, this woman rapidly approaches you. And you think, okay, she's coming to greet me. She's coming, she's coming to say hi. No, no. Her first words are to scold you for bringing coffee into the sanctuary. Because you might, you know, spill it on the 50-year-old carpet. You see, she's so caught up on these rules. She's not practicing the, the magnanimity of Christ. She's so fixated on these rules, so fixated on the fact that uh, we, have to, we have to maintain uh, this building, that she doesn't even greet you. <clears throat> now, so w- what we see here is that we can stand firm as a life-giving community. We can, we can avoid this uh, being obsessed about the rules when we take on this era of magnanimity. This almost maturity, this idea of saying, uh, I'm not going to get sucked into these petty things. Now, in verse 6, Paul gives us a fourth thing that we must do if we as a community are going to stand firm uh, under tremendous societal pressure. He says, do not worry about anything. It's an easy one there. Um, Now, in saying do not worry, what Paul is saying is, uh, don't don't be someone who... uh, uh, perseverates on the future, the what is, what could happen, what, what's going to happen. Don't carry, uh, I heard a, an excellent quote, don't carry the burden of the future on yourselves. As a community, don't uh, take on the worries and um, things that you can have anxiety about in the future. You see, this actually probably, and we often read this passage and we think, okay, this is talking about in just an individualistic way, I just have to internalize this as an individual, but really we have to, we have to internalize this as a community. He's talking to a community saying, do not worry about anything. And I I think this actually finds its way into our community, especially our local community, uh, very easily. You see, uh, when we think about this, uh, we can think about certain elections. Um, uh, What's kind of a crazy phenomenon that happens in the United States is that uh, after some elections, uh, guns will fly off the shelves. Survival equipment will fly off the shelves. People have a ton of anxiety about this. Uh, society is shifting. Uh, I, I need to go out. I need, I need to protect myself. I need, I need to go be armed. They feel uh, they isolate themselves. They're terrified about what the future might hold. But instead, Paul says, instead of doing this, instead of responding with this anxiety, with this worry, he says, uh, but, in everything, but in every situation, make your request known to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Paul says they should not worry, but instead respond with prayer. As a community, they should come together when they're facing this pressure, this anxiety uh, that is brought by uh, culture, by society to change. And he tells them to pray. But I I want you to notice something here. And this really changes what he's saying. We have to really understand this. He says, with thanksgiving. You see, the idea expressed here is that... um, as a community, we're coming before God and we're saying, we cast our cares on you. We cast our anxieties, we cast our worries on you. And as we do, we participate in thankfulness. We're continually remembering who you are. Continually celebrating who, what, what, the good things that you've done in the past and anticipating the good things you will do in the future. And so central here is this idea of thanksgiving. He's calling them to thanksgiving. Calling them to approach God in prayer, uh, expectant that God will provide expectant that, that they will uh, that god will do things that they will be thankful for and looking into the past looking at his attributes being thankful for who he is <clears throat> they are beholding god through thanksgiving mm-hmm. now in verse seven paul actually he's going to tell us the results of this he's going to tell us what happens uh, when we do this when we approach god continually as a community thanking him he says as a result God's peace, which excels all human planning, will stand guard over your thoughts and feelings in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> I want to be—I want to be clear here and say this is a promise of results. You see, uh, instead of being a community of anxiety and fear, he's saying you can be an, a community of God's peace. Amen. Now. This, this word, God's peace, we don't often understand this completely. Uh, what he's talking about here 
is the, the peace that God himself has. That's a pretty powerful result. That's a pretty powerful thing to declare to say, you as a community, your thoughts and your minds, uh, God, the, the peace of God will come upon you if you approach God praying with thanksgiving. Now, he says of this peace, it's that which excels all human planning. And basically what he means like this, about this is that this is peace that you're not going to be able to dream up, you're not going to be able to plan up, you're not going to be able to uh, manipulate to, to get. This is, a piece that, this, is, this is a piece that transcends our human experience, our human planning. And he says of this piece further, he says, uh, it will stand guard over your thoughts and feelings in Christ Jesus. And this raises a really important question for us. So this is a really critical question for us. And that question is, uh, who are we guarding against? And I would suggest to you that it, it, uh, what he's talking about here is uh, sin, the force of evil, and I would say the devil. And, and that, that raises another question. What can the devil take from us? We know that uh, we, we believe uh, that when Christ takes hold of us, he, he can't. Uh, the devil can't do anything. He can't, he can't take us. He can't, our souls are secure in him. Yes, amen. We belong to God. But what he can take is our peace. Mm-hmm. He can take our joy. Mm-hmm. I think this is something to think about. As we look to this eternal destiny that we are part of, um, what can the devil take for us? He can take our peace and he can take our joy. And so Paul here is saying, uh, continually approach God with thanksgiving. And when you do, uh, the, the, the very peace of God, the peace that is uh, a part of his nature, will be a, will be a part of your community, will, be a, will sit amongst your minds, guarding you and protecting you. As this societal pressure is bearing down on you to change, at all times, uh, the peace of God will stand guard Amen. over your thoughts and your feelings. We can live as a life-giving community, a vibrant community, when we continually approach God with thanksgiving, when we continually go before him saying, "Uh, you are a good God. When we continue to look to those things that we're God, we look to those qualities of God, all the the good that he has done. Now in verse 8 and 9, Paul gives us the final uh, thing that we must do. And I'm going to warn you up front, uh, this in English, we would say that there's two things left. But Paul, he's going he's to cram them in together because he's going to weave them together. Um, and you'll notice the last two slides are made up of uh, eight and nine. Um, and so what, what I'm going to have to say up front is we're not going to be able to go through each and every one of the things that he lists off here. But what we see Paul doing is he's actually, uh, first of all, he's, he's calling them to, to have a filter. And we're going to see this in verse eight. This is what he says. And last of all, my Christian friends, Since there is moral excellence, and since there are things worthy of praise, focus your minds on these things. On whatever is truthful, whatever is majestic and awe-inspiring, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever whatever calls forth love, whatever is winsome. Now, in this this verse, uh, Paul starts out by saying uh, that there are things that are morally excellent. There are things that are worthy of praise. And then he lists off this really weird list, and we don't really see it in English, but what he's doing is he's actually uh, borrowing from the local culture. He's taking from the culture, and he's using a list of civic virtues that would have been found amongst all the moral philosophers of the day. And, and what it seems like Paul is doing, what it seems like he's, he's indicating here by doing this, is that he's giving the Philippians a filter to use. A filter to say, uh, as you feel the pressure of society bearing down on you to change, uh, here's a filter. These are the things that you should take in, and these are the things that you should not take in. Um, You should take in those things which uh, call forth love, for example. Um, I want to use this as an example, but we'll just look at this this first one, how this filter would apply. Uh, Whatever calls forth love. I mean, I think for, for some of us, when we watch the news, for example... Uh, it doesn't call forth love. No. It doesn't. It calls us um, um, to hostility towards yes. each other. Yes. It calls us to, to aggression towards each other, not to um, love. It doesn't call us to greater affection, greater admiration for each other. And so Paul is is calling them to embrace what is good in the culture. He is not calling them to to live in isolation, to live out in a monastery somewhere. 
to reject the culture completely. He's saying, hey, take hold of what is good. And so in verse 9, he pairs this with something else. He pairs this together, and he says in verse 9, and keep putting into practice the lessons that you, you learned from me and the traditions that I passed on to you and the things that you heard about me and the things that you saw in me. And so Paul here, he pairs this together. He says, as you feel the, the pressure of the culture raining down on you, I'll filter out what is bad, take what is good. Uh-huh. Use what is good. Yes. But then he says here that they, at the same time, must keep putting into practice the lessons that he's taught them. And really what Paul is talking about here is that he's calling them to action. And, he, and, and the way that he wants them to act is in imitation, uh, which is what we talked about last week. He's telling them, continually imitate those things which I taught you. Continually imitate those things uh, that I laid out for you, that you saw me do. But I want to I place an emphasis here. So he says, filter out what is bad, take in what is good. But then here he's saying, uh, but also be a doer. Also be someone who acts. Mm-hmm. Be someone who's continually acting upon those things that you saw in me. And Paul says, if you do, the God of peace will be with you. What a welcome relief to a, to a church that's struggling, uh, that's kind of breaking and br- brittling underneath this pressure for societal change. They're starting to in, have infighting and anxiety. And he says, uh, if you do these things, if you uh, filter out what is, what is bad, take in what is good, if you continually follow, continually imitate me, and the, the God of peace will be with you. And another way of saying this, I, I just have a, a few little quotes here that I, I pull from commentaries that I think really capture this. He says, uh, the God who causes us to rest in our hearts, who frees us from our anxieties, who erases our worries. Amen. If the Philippians will take hold of what is good, if they will practice the example of faithfulness that Paul has laid out for them, they will stand firm. They will, uh, they will stand firm because the peace of God will be with them. Mm-hmm. Because they'll be able to share in relationship. They won't succumb to anxieties. They won't succumb to fear. And what that brings us to, as we kind of look over this, is we have these kind of competing ideas here. We can become a community that, that breaks down. We lose our magnanimity. We, we, we begin to fear. We begin to shed our traditions. We begin to... Uh, break underneath the pressure. Mm -hmm. Or, as Paul says here, we can be those who stand firm, faithfully pursuing God and pursuing others. Faithfully pursuing each other, seeking each other out, helping one another, practicing humility towards one another, but also approaching God with thanksgiving, with praise, rejoicing in what he's done. So on that, let's, let's close with a word of prayer.